أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بارئ الخلائق العجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين المذلومين سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد يقول الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ذلك ومن يعظم شعائر الله فإنها من تقوى القلوب صدق الله العلي العظيم وآمنا به نور مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد I would like to first I would like to begin first and foremost by congratulating Save the Islamic Heritage Organization for putting together an event such as this in honor of Jannatul Baqi' and the demolished shrines not only in Hijaz but across the Arabian Peninsula and indeed an organization that comes together to dedicate time, effort, to revere and uphold this position of Ahlul Bayt granted to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commendable. And it is something for us to take pride to be a part of such an organization, even if it is through participation. And inshallah, this becomes a platform not only to make this a national event inside of the United Kingdom, but in Europe and the world, where every year mass gatherings are held until the shrines of Jannatul Baqi are restored. All of this with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. For the allocated time that I have, there are a number of topics that I want to cover and I felt that perhaps it would be best to cover this by way of an index. And inshallah, it opens the doors for further research. It opens the doors for contemplation, tadabbur, and tafakkur. And it also opens the doors for tanzim. Tanzim, yani to organize ourselves. You find that one of the final wasiyah that was given by Amir al Mu'minin salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad to his son Imam al Mujtaba and to his children in general he points out to them to paraphrase this part of the wasiyah that by Allah organize your affairs organization of our affairs in order to build a strategy and to follow up with this strategy, to have a coordinated movement where we are able to rally all the different Shia centers within the UK. And further than that, all the Muslim centers, and perhaps more than that, monotheistic organizations that subscribe to the Abrahamic faith to stand up hand in hand for the cause of Jannatul Baqi'ah. For this to happen, we need tanzim, organization. And inshallah, hopefully through this next couple of minutes, next the time that is allocated to us, we can try and go through this step by step. Number one, ahibai, the destruction of Jannatul Baqi and Jannatul Mu'allah is a crime on a number of fronts. It is a crime against history, number one. Number two, it constitutes of a crime against archaeology. Number three, it is a crime against ideology. And number four, it is a crime against humanity in its entirety, as we shall see. 
a crime against history. Ahibai, when you find the entire world is investing millions if not trillions of dollars to preserve their history, you find over here a faction of an ideology that claims to be a representation of Islam spending millions of dollars to destroy this Islamic history. A crime against archaeology or architecture. You find that the construction, the materials used for the constructions of the shrines inside of Jannatul Mu'allah and Jannatul Baqi. The archaeological makeup of the Qubab, the Qubba, the shining domes in itself was an attestation of the forward movement and far-thinking advancement of Muslim archaeology even before perhaps the Western world had made gains such as those. A crime against ideology. An open attack against the Madhab of Ahlul Bayt. When this attack on Jannatul Baqi happened, Ya Ahibai, the fact that till today the harams of Imam al Mujtaba and Sadiq and Bakir and Zainul Abideen, amongst others, the fact that these graves are destroyed till today, this is a cry in the face of the followers of Ahlul Bayt that we hold enmity against Ahlul Bayt. This destruction has consequences that are far reached, whether we comprehend these or not. This destruction of Jannatul Baqi is to tell you because we were not there in Karbala. Here we are to obliterate the dhikr of Ahlul Bayt. Do we comprehend this threat and the extent of this threat through the destruction of Jannatul Baqi and perhaps what this destruction signifies? A crime against humanity. A crime against humanity as we shall see in the end. But a quick note over here. A crime against humanity because these shrines represent divine guidance. These shrines are places of divine inspiration. So long as these shrines exist, the entire humanity has a doorway to find eternal truth and get eternal salvation. So long as these shrines exist, the doors of Hidayah are open to anyone and everyone, regardless of color, creed, or faith. These doors of guidance were closed with the destruction of Jannatul Baqiyah. I look at Sayyid al-Shuhada. The ziyara of Sayyid al-Shuhada and the haram of Sayyid al-Shuhada, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, has become a door of guidance towards tashayyu without mubalagha, without exaggeration, for millions of people across the globe. Different levels of hidayah. Millions of people. There was this woman, this is Bain al Qawsain, it just came to my mind. But to show you the importance of shrines and the reverence of these shrines, there was a woman serving in the American army. And this was during the time of just immediately she was sent just immediately after the downfall of Saddam. There was a time of great turbulence inside of Iraq. And you may have read about the first Arba'in that took place. Because these were processions and gatherings that were banned under the time of the dictator Saddam. For the first Arba'in that happens, and at that time, from what I remember, there were close to about between 1.5 and 3 million people who went for this first Arba'in. And as millions of people, not only from inside of Iraq, but from outside of Iraq, embarking upon this walk to Jannah on earth. Millions of people in one direction. Ya akhi, a nation that has been oppressed ever since the inception of Iraq in itself. People who are torn by bloodshed and war 
roadside explosives, the economy is in chaos. Despite everything, people have left whatever they have, whatever they could salvage, despite all these issues. Labbaika ya Hussein. They walk in that direction. Million and a half to three million people. At that time, Paul Bremer from the American government was visiting Iraq. And as they were traveling to Baghdad, and he was in his helicopter, and they see that millions of people are walking, and this was something that was never experienced before, never seen, mashhad, yani, something that you see with your own eyes. And as they met, they had taken one of the palaces of Saddam to be the preliminary or the temporary make house uh, gathering place in which the interim government would then be elected and the constitution and so on and so forth before the decree of Ayatollah al-Uzma, Sayyid Ali al-Sistani. May Allah grant him and all of us ulama a long and healthy life. Fa, they come and they have a debrief. You know, what is this issue? Million and a half people. Ahna now, when we come and we look at the statistics of Arba'in, MashaAllah, 10, 15, 20, 30 million people. 1.5 at that time. She Khayali. Between 1.5 to 3. So they come, they have a debrief, and they see what is happening. They bring a, lo they bring a number of local Iraqi people who were involved at that time with setting up the government and translators and so on and so forth. And they explain the issue of Arba'in. This lady, who was perhaps not very senior as a cadet, when she hears about who Imam Hussein is, they said to her, they are walking to Hussein. They asked, who is Hussein? Is he, is he a local hero, candidate, somebody who was in exile? Many people who were in exile from the ulama came back and they were received in their thousands. She said, who is this? They said, no, no. This is a person who was a grandson of the Prophet, martyred. 1400 years ago, they revere him. So this lady who was not that high within the ranks, cadet but not that high within the ranks, she goes to her seniors and she asks, from what they tell us about Hussein to be a saint, can I get official permission from the, you know, whichever military uh, contingency she was working with to go and visit Karbala, to go to Karbala and to witness? They say to her that, you know, as within the protocol that is there, you cannot go or venture out on your own, outside of your duty of military function, and if you were to go there on your own private time, there has to be a convoy, otherwise there is no assurance or guarantee given to your safety, security, madrishu, all these things. Somehow, something inside of her heart, she goes and on her own, she manages to sign forms that she takes full liability, that if anything happens to her, the American military is not responsible. She goes and she walks. She goes towards Karbala. She didn't walk, but she went to Karbala from Baghdad. And she had a translator with her. She, a translator. A translator himself says, I felt ashamed. She was asking me questions about Imam al Hussein. He said, I felt ashamed. I said, maybe she won't understand the meaning of sacrifice in the way of Allah. She will not be able to comprehend these deeper meanings. She so said, I felt ashamed. So when she was asking me why people are insistent to go to Hussein, he said to her, the people think, or it is within the belief of the people, that since Hussein is the grandson of the Prophet, he can fulfill the desires of any person. Qadi al-Hawa'ij. Look at the door of guidance. It happens, this lady... From the time that she was married and through the time that she was in service in the American military, she was not able to conceive. She says, I went up and I was guided towards the gate of Hussein ibn Ali. And she says, I saw two domes, golden domes up into the skies. I have a feeling that she was standing by al Haramain. And those who know the significance and the spirituality and the energy inside of Bain al Haramain know what I'm talking about. She says, I looked at the shrine and I said, a million people, and she's talking to Imam al Hussein, Fitra, Dalil Fitri. She says, she mentions, 
I spoke to the person, I don't know Hussein. I said, oh Hussein, a million and a half people come here walking through roadside explosives and this and that, thinking that you will fulfill their desires. I am one of these 1.5 million people. I've never had children. Please bless me with children. Sure enough, she returns back to Baghdad. She's suspended from her duty for breaching military behavior, venturing outside the camp, even though she had permission from the military. She's retired back to the US. Within that first year, she conceives after 10 to 15 years of not being able to conceive. This woman now is Shia Itna Ashari and spreads the message of Aba Abdullah al Hussein within the United States. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Faya ikhwani, the shrines of Jannatul Baqiyah, doors of Hidayah and the doors of guidance, crime against humanity. Because the doors of guidance towards humanity were closed with the destruction of Jannatul Baqiyah. In any case, these are some of the ma'lumat or informational points that perhaps are not very widespread within the news, within the media, and perhaps we ourselves may not know of this in detail. But, number one, the shrines of Jannatul Baqi were actually destroyed twice. They were first destroyed in the year 1801 and the second time in 1925. In 1801, they were initially destroyed when Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab went into a political alliance with Muhammad ibn Saud, who was the emir of one of the provinces inside of Hijaz. So they decided to create a political and a religious alliance through which they would be able to conquer the land of Hijaz and to free it from the rule of the Ottoman Empire. And hence the pretext of political agenda was religion. And religion in itself was used for political gain, territorial gain. So the first time they attacked and they actually managed to attack Medina was in 1801. However, the Ottoman Empire was able to gain control again over the land of Hijaz, in particular the land of Mecca and Medina, and drive Ali Saud out. Therefore, after the first destruction or demolition of Jannatul Baqi in 1801, under the watch of the Ottoman Empire, Jannatul Baqi was reconstructed and rebuilt again until the second attack, which was in the year 1925. And the attack of 1925 is the remnants of what we see till today. It is within this attack of 1925 that the Ottoman Empire was coming to its downfall and the British colonial empire was at a rise and forking out its geographical assertion and rule over the Middle East that the party of Ibn Wahhab and the Ali Saud were able to take over a majority of Hijaz and when they got control over Medina and Mecca, they carried out this demolition for the second time. So the first time Jannatul Baqi was demolished, it was rebuilt within this period of 125, 124 odd years. And the last time it happened, 1925 till today, no reconstruction. Number two. Before the demolition of Jannatul Baqi, both in 1801 and in 1925, they didn't just go there and demolish all the graves and the shrines. Rather, what happened is that the shrines were systematically looted of their possessions. Now, you've got to understand what it means when these shrines were looted. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, kings, not only from the Arabian Peninsula, but from the subcontinent, traders from all across the world, regardless of their faith, when they came to perform the pilgrimage, they would visit Medina and they would visit Mecca and they would gift jewels and treasures to the respective Imams by leaving these gifts within their harams. In fact, some of the historical texts notice that even Harun al-Abbasi had left a sword 
whose weight was about 25 kilograms, the handle of which was gold and the cover was also gold plated as a gift from him, Harun al-Abbasi, to Rasulullah. Regardless of Harun's yani, open enmity towards Ahlul Bayt, just to give you an idea of the types of people and the type of gifts that had accumulated within the haram of Rasulullah and within the haram of Ahlul Bayt inside of Jannatul Baqi. All of this was looted. One of the historians comes and says, tons of gold were looted. Tom, Ahibai, familiar with current gold day prices. Shkat, what is the value of gold per gram it is calculated today? Tons of gold belonging to Ahlul Bayt's haram were looted at that time. This is number two. Number three, Ikhwani, people come and demolish the shrines of Ahlul Bayt, shrines that have got a history up to going back to, going back to 90 AH. Yani, 90 AH. Thousands of years these shrines have been there. You think a warring faction comes, gains control over Medina, decide one day that they're going to demolish the shrines and everything is okay? La, abadan la. Ahibai, even the enemy has takhtit, even the enemy plans. What was the justification for destroying Jannatul Baqi'ah? Historians mention that in order to demolish Jannatul Baqi before the demolition act was carried out, Ali Saud, the ruling faction of Ali Saud, together with those who are the faces of Wahhabism, the teachings of Muhammad ibn Wahhab, Abdul Wahhab, they come together and they put out an if istifta istifta religious query to the leading group of muftis inside of Mecca and Medina and they ask these muftis inside the fatwa is it permissible to build a structure over the graves of the awliya of other human beings and take them as a mosque or does this constitute of shirk Historians come forward and in fact an Egyptian newspaper at that time which printed out the report after the demolition comes forward and says that within this panel of 10 to 15 muftis sitting inside of Mecca, the highest level of muftis for this land of the Haramain, all under certain type of pressure, under certain type of uh, stress, and others who were bribed shined the fatwa stating that building a structure over the graves of the awliya and the asfiya is bid'ah. So they got that religious justification to go and destroy the shrines of Jannatul Baqi'ah. And within this there are lessons, Ahibai, when people want to destroy Islam, they use Islam as a justification to destroy Islam. They came under a religious pretext. Ali Saud did not come saying that they are the Kofar and the Mushrikeen and they are the representatives of Bani Umayya. Abadan la, Muttaki, Mu'mineen. We have come to liberate you from the Ottoman Empire. We have come to make sure that you are not part of the great British colonial empire. We are here to protect Tawheed. This was the pretext that was used to demolish Jannatul Baqi'ah. Ahna, people of Wa'i, people of Basira, people who are sharp in their religion and are sharp in understanding the plot of the enemy, need to understand this tactic. They used the Quran, they used Islam to destroy Ahlul Bayt, and they used Islam to destroy Islam. This is number three. Number four. There are over 300 mosques or grave sites that were destroyed systematically by Ali Saud in addition to Jannatul Baqi and Jannatul Mu'allah. 300. 
One of the ulama by the name of Ayatollah al-Uzma, Muhakkik al-Thani or Mujaddid al-Thani as he's popularly referred to Rahmatullah alayhi, has compiled the book together of the Masajid and the Mazarat in the lands of Hijaz. And from those that were demolished inside of Jannatul Baqi, Baytul Huzn, and majority of them are of the opinion that the greatest Qubba, the biggest Qubba to shine in Jannatul Baqi was the Qubba of Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. Next to the Qubba of Imam al Mujtaba, there was a smaller Qubba known as the Qubba of Fatima. And this is most commonly known as Baytul Huzn. This house that Amir al Mu'mineen built for Sayyid al Zahra to mourn Rasulullah for, because when she mourned in her house, the shuyuk of Saqifa would come forward and they would say to Amir al Mu'mineen, Your wife cries in the day and cries in the night. We are not able to sleep at night nor work in the day. So tell her to cry either in the morning or in the evening. What did Amir al Mu'mineen do? Build a house for Sayyid al Zahra in Jannah al Baqi, known as Bayt al Huzn. She would hold the hand of Imam Hassan and Imam al Hussein, go there from morning to night and weep for Rasulullah. That is Baytul Huzn, destroyed in Jannatul Baqi. More than that, you have Masjid al Jumu'ah, which was close to Masjid al Quba. Masjid al Jumu'ah was that masjid where Rasulullah initiated the first and prayed the first ever Salatul Jumu'ah. And now we have a whole surah inside of the Quran, Surah Al Jumu'ah. Muslimin across the world recite Salatul Jumu'ah every Friday. Tayyib, show us where is the first mosque that Rasulullah recited Salatul Jumu'ah. Destroyed and rubble. And it's not far distance from Masjid al Quba. Next, Masjid al Fatah. This conquer of bloodless conquer over Makkah and the victory of Rasulullah over Makkah. That first entry point, where in Makkah, where through Makkah did Rasulullah actually enter? And conquer Makkah, there was a masjid built, the Masjid al Fatih. Show us where this masjid is. A masjid that was supposed to represent the victory of Tawheed over Kufr was destroyed. Tell me, Ali Saud, which party are you on? The party of Kufr or the party of Tawheed? Masjid al Fatih destroyed. Ba'ad, cover of Sayyid Ismail ibn Imam al Sadiq. You know, the Ismaili, our brothers from the Ismaili sect, whether from all the different sects that, in, that exist from within the Ismailiyah, they go back to Ismail ibn Imam al Sadiq on the pretext that Imam al Sadiq went into Ghaiba. The cover of Ismail ibn Imam al Sadiq is in Jannatul Baqi, destroyed. Else, the grave in itself would be a central point of ideological debate to prove the validity of the Ithna Ashariya. What they say is in Ghaiba, show us the cover. Aku cover in Jannatul Baqi. But more than that, Sayyida Amina in Abwa, the mother of Rasulullah, Abwa was a city or a small town between Makkah and Medina. In fact, every year inside of Abwa at the grave of Sayyida Amina, there used to be an entire week of celebrations for Mawlud al-Nabi. And this went on Bali until I think the 1950s or 1940s. And it was funded by Local Saudi businessmen who are not even Shia Ithna Ashari. Sayyidah Amina. Is there a cover for her? No, it was destroyed. In fact, what the reports come forward is that the graves of Sayyidah Khadija, Umbul Mu'mineen, and Sayyidah Amina were blown up using TNT. About 15 or 25 kilo, I cannot remember at the moment. 15 to 25 kilos of TNT planted inside the shrine to blow it up. Masjid Raddu Shams. A masjid where uh, which was built on the place where for Rasulullah the son returned back. Yeah, Akhi, you have a point, a place in Mecca where a miracle happened that defines everything we know about cosmology. Even that trace was destroyed. Janatul Baqi and Janatul Mu'alla were very few of what more was destroyed. More than that, this destruction was not limited to 1925. Rather, it has been systematically happening throughout. The first pretext that was used was that the muftis came forward and said that it is shirk and kufr, or bid'ah. The second pretext that was used to destroy a number of shrines and places of ziyara inside of Mecca and Medina was the pretext of expansion of the haram. 
expansion of the haram can happen without having to destroy your historical places like the way we see in Karbala in the Najaf al Ashraf. The grave of Abdullah, the father of Rasulullah, Sayyidah Abdullah al Hashimi, father of Rasulullah. He had a mosque, he had a qabr, which was a separate place, Mazar. His grave has now been demolished and has been made part of the general tawsi'ah. The general tawsi'ah, expansion of the haram. More than that, crime against humanity, we had said in the beginning. The grave of Sayyidah Hawa, mother of humanity, along with Nabi Adam, from the first human beings to be created. Her grave used to be in Jiddah. A number of Zawar, whether they were going for Hajj or for Umrah, it would be almost uh, part and parcel of the Umrah or the Hajj trip that those who are landing inside of Jiddah would go to perform the Haram of Sayyidah Hawa. In fact, Jiddah was named after her. Jiddah yani Jadda. Jadda yani grandmother. Grandmother as in she's the, our mother, the first woman to be created by Allah. Is it not a point of fakhr with the destruction of Sayyidah Hawa? This is why we say that the day of Jannatul Baqi should be a day for all Abrahamic faiths. With the Christian, with the Jew. Hawa is revered or is supposed to be revered at least. Keeping aside distorted text. At a time where people question the origin of human beings do you not think it's important that the grave of the first human being to be created by god should be a place of mazar that stands out and shines out these are the crimes of Ali Saud. the destruction i think i've almost finished my time no maybe i will take five minutes extra inshallah if there is no harm in this muhammad wa ala muhammad more than this, ya ahibai, the consequences of the demolition of Jannatul Baqi, the destruction has been used, which happened in 1925 and before that in 1801, has been used as a justification by satellite terrorist groups to destroy historical and religious sites inside of Iraq, inside of Syria, and across a number of places in North Africa, even if they are Sufi shrines, the fact that they are shrines that represent some sort of religious importance, they should be preserved. Even if they were Sufi, Allah Azza wa Jal preserved the body of Fir'aun. Samara was destroyed. How many sites inside of Babel, Christian sites have been destroyed? Inside of Syria, Hajar ibn Uday. For crimes that happened in 1925, you find because they were unaddressed, because they were unchallenged to a great extent, those crimes that happened in the past are now being used today to justify terrorist movement and terrorist actions and destructions. And hence we say what happened in 1925, the roots that happened over there, has an impact on what happens today in which we live. Standing up for Jannatul Baqi, standing up for humanity, Ahibai. What can we do? What needs to be done from us? Number one, diplomatic pressure. Through letters, number one, letters, letters and emails to the Saudi embassy. How many Shia Muslims do we have inside of the UK? Even though. It might be the commemoration of Jannatul Baqi, but most of them are in party mode because Shahrul Ramadan has just finished. And this is one challenge that needs to be addressed. And to be honest, because of its proximity towards Eid, a lot of people are in party mode. And Jannatul Baqi doesn't get that importance. But what can be done from our side? How many Shia are inside of the UK? For example, 5,000 Shia. 5,000 people to write an email. To the Saudi embassy, inquiries at, I don't know, whatever it is, Saudi embassy.sa or whatever it is. 2,000, 5,000 emails every week. Do you think that not creates some type of pressure? Letters being sent in, flood their mailbox. It's even five minutes of our time to send an email we don't have. Send a letter we don't have. The result, whether it happens or not, is not important. 
What is important is the effort. Diplomatic pressure by conferences, liaising with our local MPs, putting forward our case to the UN. If we could have an organization as great as this, saving Muslim heritage, to be a part of UNESCO, and to push forward their agenda with UNESCO. And you have an entire Shia Ummah starting from the UK, followed with Europe and the world, backing this organization and movement, forcing UNESCO to acknowledge Jannat al as a historic site. We don't need the money from Ali Saud to reconstruct. We'll sell our houses to build Jannat al Is a movement that can happen? Yes, it can happen. It just depends on our determination. More than that, facilitating for academic dis discussions on the permissibility, rather the obligation, and I use this word very, very carefully, the obligation, yani wujub, from the Quran, the wujub of building tombs and structures over the graves of the awliya. This is a discussion on its own. But we need to have, can we prove this from the Quran? Can we prove this from the Hadith? Are we ourselves educated to be inside of debates? When people come and ask us, we need to equip ourselves. Internal movement amongst the Shia to unite and to ensure that Jannatul Baqi is made as the single greatest, most major, biggest priority of the Shia. Building Jannatul Baqi. This has to happen. If we are not concerned and not worried, nobody will be concerned and worried for us. Publication of books and materials in regards to Jannatul Baqi in multiple languages, so on and so forth. The list goes on. I was asked to speak about Imam Hassan as well, and I will not take too much of your time from here. Ahibai from the graves that were destroyed, the graves of Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. You know the importance of Imam al Mujtaba? In three statements, I try to summarize for you. Number one, he was, after Rasulullah, the first person to be under the Kisa in the event of Hadith al Kisa. You know, everybody who came in under the Kisa and the event of Hadith al Kisa. This tartib, this chronology is not a chronology that happened by chance. This is a tartib, ilahi. The chronology is decided by Allah Azza wa Jal with, with secrets behind them. Which is why you find when Jibreel asks Allah, وَمَنْ هُمْ تَحْتَ الْكِسَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies by saying, whom? Fatima, وَأَبُوهَا وَبَعْلُهَا they started with Fatima, not with Rasulullah. Why the chronology has a deep significance, has a secret aqaidi behind it. Fatima, center of Ahlul Bayt. Same thing with Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. Why was he the first one to be under the Hadith al Kisha? Have you ever contemplated over it? This is from the Fada'il and there are secrets behind this. This in itself is a lecture in its entirety. Number one. Number two. Karbala. They were companions of Imam al Hussein. To a great extent, majority, if not all of them, were products of the tarbiyah of Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. Habib ibn Madahir, a product of the tarbiyah of Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. Abis, a product of the tarbiyah of Imam Hassan al Mujtaba. Imam al Mujtaba played a role in nourishing a group of Shia who would then be from those Ansar and the Ashab of Imam al Hussein. For the loyalty that you see in Habib, the credit goes to Imam Hassan al Mujtaba for the role that he played in nourishing Habib ibn Madahir. In charge of the Baytul Mal during the time of Amir al Mu'mineen. This one individual who exposed Muawiyah through the ceasefire until Yawmul Qiyamah. Na'i Na'i is very heartbreaking to recite a Masai for Jannah al -Baki. Because as this one poet says, he says, I went to perform the Hajj and renew my bay'ah of Tawheed towards Allah. He said, as I renewed my bay'ah to the Lord of the universe and confirmed in my belief in Tawheed. 
I turned around to look at those individuals who spent their life assisting the Prophet to establish Tawheed. I went to the grave of Khadija, the woman who spent all her wealth to the extent that when she died, she doesn't or the Prophet doesn't have enough money for the coffin of Khadija. This lady Khadija, whose coffin was brought down by Jibra'il from the heavens, I look around and I cry, Ya Ummul Mu'mineen, where is your grave? I see nothing but rubbles. I go towards Medina. I look at Bakir and I look at Sadiq, the teachers of my faith. I look at Mujtaba, the one whose janaza was shot by arrows. I look for Sajjad, the prisoner of Karbala. Where are your graves? I see nothing but rubble. I turn towards Ummul Banin. O oh, Ummul Banin, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you, Ya Ummul Banin, for giving birth to a master like Abbas. Abbas who gave his arms for Hussein. Abbas who gave his arms for Sukaina and for this deen. Ummul Banin, let me thank you. Where do I find the grave of Ummul Banin? Huh? They say from all these graves that were there in Jannah al is the grave of Muhsin al Shaheed. Allah. I want to come and I want to give condolences O Mohsin under what circumstances were you killed it is as if I am standing by the door of Fatima when the Fir'aun of the Ummah comes in he kicks the door upon Fatima crushing her between the door and the wall she cries out Ya Abata Ya Rasul Allah how is the Ummah treating me after you Allah, the narration mentions there are eight people who kicked Fatima in the stomach. Eight people kicked Fatima in the stomach. Mohsin became Shaheed and the daughter of the Prophet broke her rib. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. We pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to reward each and every one of us for holding this majlis for the honor of the Aimma of Jannatul Baqi. We pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to make this project and to make this movement a successful movement inshallah one that inspires us and inspires those who are not here and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of Mawlana Sahib al-Amri wa zaman wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen yakulu la ta'ala inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima